Quiet on the set. Camera speed. Sound production, take one. Action! Welcome to From Beneath the Hollywood Sign. If you love old movies, Hollywood history, or the golden age of filmmaking, you've come to the right place. This is the podcast that talks about amazing stories of Tinseltown from another era. Hear fascinating conversations with writer-producer Steve Kubine, who quite literally lives just beneath the Hollywood sign, and actress-writer Nan McNamara. Now your hosts, Steve and Nan. Welcome back to another episode. Hi, Nan. Hi, Steve. We are starting a new feature on From Beneath the Hollywood Sign. Kicking off the month of March. We're, we're, we're shaking things up, and we're going to do, and we're, we'll do this every month, a star of the month. Oh, I love it. Where we're basically going to talk about the life and career of a worthy performer. Yeah, do a deep dive. Yeah, a little deep dive and suggest movies that you may not know that they were in. And so this inaugural star of the month is one of my favorites. Yes. It's going to be Paul Douglas. Well, one of the reasons I love Paul Douglas is I love any actor who's a late bloomer. <laughs> <laughs> he is a late bloomer. It's funny, you may not know his name, but I guarantee you, you will know his face. For sure. Uh, he had one of those great character faces. He, he looked really gruff. He was this big, beefy guy. And you've seen him in a million movies and probably didn't realize it. But we're going to tell you all about those movies. And he played... Heroes, villains, comedic yes. roles. He really ran the gamut. Yeah, he had a great range. You know, he was this hulking, boorish, gravel-voiced, sometimes bombastic actor that, that, that really, really left an impression on Hollywood. His film debut is pretty spectacular. Yes. What a way to start a film. And he, and his, he made his debut, as you mentioned, at the age of 42. Yeah. So good on you, Paul. Yeah. He played the cheating but reformed husband of Linda Darnell in the... Mankiewicz directed film A Letter to Three Wives 1949 which is one of my faves oh such a fantastic movie and what a great screen debut you know of course it also starred Gene Crane and Anne Southern and Kirk Douglas it was a huge hit the film huge and hit. it made him a pretty instant star yeah so over the course of his relatively short career if you, if you think about it he ended up playing bosses and coaches and businessmen blue collar types uh, but still, on occasion, he was cast as the very unlikely romantic leading man. Right. Which gave him a chance to really show the tender heart that was beating beneath that gruff exterior. Yeah. Which is what he does in A Letter to Three Wives. Yes, yes. I love this quote <laughs> that you have. He was quoted as saying, the public's so relieved to see somebody besides a junior Adonis in the boy meets girl setup, they give me a cheer. <laughs> Guys look at me and say, if that mug can win a gal, it's a cinch for me, <laughs> which is such a self-deprecating thing I to know, say. which makes you love him even more. Yeah. Well, he was born Paul Douglas Fleischer on April 11th, 1907 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He was born into an upper class family. His father was actually a well-known doctor. Okay. He performed performed plays in high school and, and later attended Yale University briefly. He dropped out. It okay. wasn't for him. <laughs> and so he embarked on a very short-lived football career before he that. got into acting. Yes. Then he drifted into radio um, and became very successful sportscaster and master of ceremony back in his hometown of Philadelphia. Which was a pretty big market. Still is a big market. Absolutely. So. In 1934, he makes the jump from Philadelphia to New York City to work for a little station called called CBS. <laughs> not, not too shabby. <laughs> yeah. And he hosts a popular music program called the Saturday Night Swing Club from 34, 1934 to 1939. That really makes him very well known. Yes, absolutely. But while he was in New York, he gets bitten by the acting bug again. So he starts appearing in stock and in off-Broadway plays, okay. testing the waters a bit. And finally, in November of 1936, he makes his Broadway debut, playing what else but a radio announcer. <laughs> a radio announcer. <laughs> yeah, it was in a comedy called Double Dummy. 
Okay. Which I don't know much about. No, never great heard title. Of it. Yeah. And the play yes. only runs a month. It, it yeah, it closed early, but you know, he was he was bitten. I, I think that was it. He he had to act. So he becomes one of the country's most popular and successful radio stars. He serves as announcer and straight man to Jack Benny and Fred Allen. I mean, you can't get much bigger I, than those exactly. folks on radio. George Burns and Gracie Allen. And uh, he even got to call the World Series in 1937. I know. Isn't that great? I would love to find uh, a, recording. a recording of that yeah. to, to hear him call the World Series. Very cool. Things changed for him probably in 1946 was making a fortune in radio, but he really walked away from it all to appear in a play on Broadway. It wasn't just any play. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was he by... He picked a good one. <laughs> you know, he, if you're going to leave your radio career, this is the one. Yeah. It was by renowned writer Garson Kanan, and it was his comedy Born Yesterday, mm. which we all know about the boorish rich man who basically underestimates his showgirl girlfriend, who he takes along with him on a trip to Washington, D.C. to bribe a congressman for political favors. Right. So he plays that... He plays the boorish guy. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and of course... Of course, the, the showgirl was played by Judy Holliday, the great, who got the break of a lifetime when another film star, Gene Arthur, dropped out and she was the understudy who got to step up and like 42nd Street went on. Went on. <laughs> became and, a star. And became a star. Yeah. Yeah. So the play also starred Gary Merrill as the journalist, um, which was then played by Will, William Holden in the film. Yes. So the play is an overnight sensation. It ran for three and a half years. Imagine that. Yeah. 1,642 performances. <laughs> wow. So it's one of the longest running plays in Broadway history. Yeah. For his performance, he won a Theater World Award, and he was awarded the Clarence Derwin Award as the most promising male. Wow. He was 39 at the time. Most promising male at 39. <laughs> I love that. I love that. So as we've talked about about other stars in the past, this Broadway success catches the eye of Hollywood, of course, because they're always looking they for They always people. troll Broadway for their new stars. <laughs> yes. So he's lured West to appear in films, and this is hence the debut in Mankiewicz's A Letter to Three Wives, proving that he's not only a lead on Broadway, but he can be a Hollywood leading man as well. Yes. And funny, when Columbia Pictures ended up buying the screen rights to his smash Broadway success in Born Yesterday... Of course they wanted Douglas to re repeat his Broadway success. And wouldn't you think he would? You think he would jump all over it? Yeah. He turned it down wow. because he didn't like the script. He felt that the narrative's focus had shifted to favor the Judy Holiday character and her journalist teacher, who, as you mentioned, was now played by William Holden in the movie. Right. So he is replaced by Broderick Crawford. Who's a total lookalike. I yeah, mean, they, really they look are. so much alike. Sometimes I would forget or get confused which movie was Broderick, which movie was Paul Douglas. Yes. There's a fascinating story about Judy Holliday getting cast. Harry Cohn, head of Columbia Pictures, did not want to hire her, even though she had originated the role on Broadway. Yes, it was a smashing success. Yes. At various times, he it was reported that Rita Hayworth, Gloria Graham, Lana Turner, and even Gene Arthur, who had dropped out of the Broadway <laughs> version, that he wanted them to play the role. And this next little twist in the story is just classic. Which I, I love this twist. And there's a little bit to it. When Judy Holliday made her Broadway debut in Born Yesterday... Catherine Hepburn was in the audience. <laughs> Catherine Hepburn was absolutely captivated with Judy Holliday. Yeah. She thought she was one of the most talented women she'd seen, great comedian. So she became a big champion for Judy Holliday. And this is where it ties in with Judy getting the part in the movie. Harry Cohn's not sold, so Catherine Hepburn gets... Garson Kanan. Garson Kanan <laughs> and, and his Gordon. wife, Ruth Gordon, right, to, to cast her in this very showy part in her latest movie, Adam's Rib from 1949, which also starred Spencer Tracy. Right. And so it highlights not only her <laughs> comedic ability, but it's also a, a dramatic role. Yes. I mean, it's, Adam's Rib is considered a comedy. So finally, Harry Cohn is convinced <laughs> to give her the part in Born Yesterday. And what does she do? She goes on to win the Best Actress yeah. Oscar for her performance. So I guess we can thank Catherine Hepburn <laughs> for robbing Gloria Swanson of her 
rightful Oscar for Sunset Boulevard. Right, right. <laughs> Again, I'm harping on it. <laughs> <laughs> but Paul Douglas does get to play the role yes. in the television version of Born Yesterday in 1957. And he stars with Mary Martin. Yeah, which would, would have been interesting. Yeah. He didn't dwell too much on losing the part. He got busy on his own career. And his career took off like gangbusters. His popularity soared and he's in a series of very successful films, including the baseball film It Happens Every Spring in 1949, which co-starred Gene Peters and Ray Milland. And then he re-teamed with A Letter to Three Wives co-star Linda Darnell in the musical comedy Everybody Does It, also 1949. I wonder if he sings in that. I haven't seen that movie. Yeah, I haven't either. Well, you know he's hit the big time when in 1950, the next year, he's asked to host the Academy Awards. Yes. Now, I mean, nowadays, when people are very <laughs> trepidatious about Nobody wants that. to host. Yeah, nobody wants to do that. But he, his star is really rising fast. After hosting the Academy Awards, I mean, his star took off. He appears in The Big Lift in 1950, which is this great war drama that co-starred Montgomery Clift. He's also in, and if you haven't seen this movie, please go see it, Panic in the Streets, also 1950. It's this crazy film noir that was way ahead of its time because it deals with a deadly virus which is unleashed on New Orleans. Oh, a really timely movie to see. Yes. Uh, it's, you know, co-star Richard Widmark and Barbara Bel Geddes. And then he appears in 14 Hours in 1951, where he is a police captain who has to talk the suicidal man, played by the great Richard, Richard Basehart, Basehart, off the ledge, literally, of a building. Fascinating movie. Richard uh, Basehart had really started out in those roles that were mentally disturbed people. I mean, I remember yes. him from repeat performance, yes. right? He, I think he played that complicated, emotionally yes. fragile guy so, so yeah, well. Yeah, he really did. So he actually lands on the cover of Life magazine. Right. In 1951, he does a film called Angels in the Outfield, a lighthearted comedy about a gruff baseball manager who gets help from an angel, and that was with Janet Lee. Yes. And then We're Not Married, 1952. I've never seen this. Oh, my God. What that movie a, is so great. <laughs> what, a, what a cast. I mean, this is a comedy with Marilyn Monroe, David Wayne, Jim. Ginger Rogers, Fred Allen, Eve Arden, <laughs> who we love, Eddie Bracken, and Mitzi Gaynor. And if you, if you haven't seen that movie, it's about all these married couples who find out that the minister who married them wasn't <laughs> legit, and now they may not be married. <laughs> I love it. It's okay, hilarious. I've got to look, look for that. He's just really knocking these films yes. out every year. Green Ice, 1954, an adventure drama with Stuart Granger and Grace Kelly. Then one of my all-time favorite films. And this, again, I would say if you can only watch one Paul Douglas movie. Yeah, would it be this one? Watch this movie. It's Clash by Night, 1952, which was directed by the great Fritz Lang. He is just so good as this unsophisticated oafish fisherman who has to deal with his wife, played by Barbara Stanwyck, having this lusty affair with his best friend, played by Robert Ryan. Wow. He's so good, and he's so he shows such vulnerability. It's an outstanding performance. And you get Barbara Stanwyck as ah, well, right? Always. He also is in the all-star cast of Executive Suite, Speak, 1954. Speaking of Barbara Stanwyck. Yeah, also with Barbara Stanwyck, <laughs> William Holden, June Allison, Frederick March, Walter Pigeon, Shelley Winters, Nita Foch, what a cast. And that won the special jury prize at the Venice Film Festival in 1954. Yeah, so his career is rocking now. Yeah, he's I'm, making the movie posters. He is making his the posters. His face is on the movie poster. <laughs> that name is above the title. Yeah. Before we get into the later years in his career and a couple of interesting twists that his life takes, it's time for our Hollywood pop quiz. Yes, and keeping with Paul Douglas, our star of the month, the question is, we just mentioned him appearing in the movie 14 Hours, where he's the cop who has to talk the guy off the ledge, Richard Basehart. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, what future screen goddess made her film debut in that movie, 14 Hours? And hint, she won an Academy Award. She did indeed. Not for that role, but... <laughs> All right, we'll be right back after this. Okay, Stephen Ann will be right back, but first another stop on the Hollywood tour. The Western hero most portrayed on the silver screen has been William Frederick Cody, better known as Buffalo Bill. 
first actor to play Buffalo Bill Cody in the movies was the man who had perfected that same role for over a quarter century on the stage and in a show arena, William F. Cody. Now, Thomas Edison invited his friend Cody to his New Jersey Kinetoscope studio. That was back in 1894. And Edison's cameraman captured Cody and several other actors in action. Buffalo Bill Cody would later be portrayed by the likes of, get this, James Ellison, Lewis Calhern, Joel McRae, Richard Arlen, Charlton Heston, Roy Rogers, Clayton Moore, Paul Newman, and Guy Stockwell. Man, that is a lot of buffaloes. <laughs> and now back to Steve and Nan from Beneath the Hollywood Sign. Welcome back, everyone. And before we go any further into the life of Paul Douglas, I just wanted to give a shout out to this week's Listener of the Week. Our Listener of the Week is Gail Vanderpoel from Alabama. Gail, thank you for your comments. Thank you for your support. Thank you for sharing our post. We love you, Gail. So back to Paul Douglas. <laughs> so it's 1955 and he decides to go back to the theater. He is in the touring company of the Kane Mutiny, but he gets into a little trouble with Actors Equity <laughs> Association, the union that governs stage actors. Yes, apparently Paul had opinions. Yeah, <laughs> and which he we like. We like opinionated <laughs> people, and apparently he shared these opinions with the Greensboro, North Carolina Gazette newspaper, which got him in some hot water. He was quoted in the newspaper saying, the South stinks. It's a land of sow belly and segregation. Well, this offended many Southern audiences. It got Douglas in trouble, although he was later quoted as saying he was misquoted. Right. He gets put on probation from Actors' Equity for a year. A year! I know! So that quickly ends his theater career. <laughs> but luckily back in Hollywood, he reteams pretty successfully with Judy Holliday from Born Yesterday in the comedy Solid Gold Cadillac in 1956. Which is such a funny movie. If you've never seen it, uh, Judy Holliday plays this woman who ends up owning like one share in this corporation and she she has thoughts and opinions as a shareholder <laughs> that she wants to share with the board. Oh, yes, okay. And so she goes and comedy ensues and she ends up falling in love with Paul Douglas, who's also this bombastic shareholder type guy. Right. Really funny comedy. They yeah. had great chemistry. Oh, yeah. I would imagine, especially after having worked together for so long on <laughs> yes. Broadway. I'm sure they carried that with them. Now, we know it's the later 50s and lots of screen actors are spending their time on television yes. as well. Paul Douglas is one of them. He's dividing his time and was cast in a 1960 episode of The Twilight Zone that was written specifically for him. Yes, it was. It was It was written by the series creator, Rod Serling, and it was based on a character that Douglas had portrayed in Angels in the Outfield. The name of the episode was The Mighty Casey, but things didn't go quite as planned. The day after the episode was completed, Paul Douglas died from complications of coronary artery disease, a heart attack. He was only 52 years old. Well, his scenes were later reshot at Rod Serling's insistence by actor Jack Warden. Hmm. Serling was later quoted as saying that even had he not passed away, he probably would have reshot the scenes. Really? Why? Because he said that Paul Douglas was lethargic. He thought he had been drinking, but I think it was he was in such poor physical shape okay. from the heart disease yes. that he just wasn't himself. And he and uh, Serling was really not pleased with the performance. Okay. And then, of course, after he passed away, he almost had a, a good reason to yes. recast, which yes. is so, so sad. And Douglas appeared in the episode's final shot in the distance with his back to the camera. Wow. Interesting. Yeah, that is interesting. We talked in a previous episode about Paul Douglas dying prior to shooting The Apartment. Billy Wilder had cast him. Yes, he was all ready to go into that production. And Fred McMurray took his place instead. I think it's tragic that his life on film is really only 10 years. Yes. Um, I mean, he's, he, he was the up-and-coming <laughs> youngster at 39. At 39. But, but really, from the time he was 42 to 52, yeah. he did pack in a lot of roles. So and a lot of many films. memorable performances. And, you know, his final screen appearance... The last film he had that was actually released was a really charming comedy called The Mating Game in 1959, 
where he played Debbie Reynolds' doting father. Hmm. And that's also a really fun movie if you've never seen it. There's a, another common denominator with many of these larger-than-life actors. He had a larger-than-life uh, <laughs> married life as well. He was married five times. He was. He was. These guys and I, gals. No, it's, and I tell you. They're uh, <laughs> trips down the aisle. Oh, boy. <laughs> he was previously married to the British actress Virginia Field, who I, I really love her. She, I think she was a really underrated actress. You know, she's probably best known for roles in uh, Waterloo Bridge and. 1940, and also a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court oh, in yes. 1949. Yeah. But we all know her from, and we just talked about this, the great film noir repeat performance yes. from 1947, which we covered on our New Year's movie episode. Yes, yes. You know, they had two children together, Johnny and Margaret. Okay. At the time of his death, Douglas was married to Jan Sterling. Love her who was Academy Award nominated yes, and was a blonde bombshell in films like Ace in the Hole, 1951, The High and Mighty, 1954, and The Harder They Fall, 1956. Yeah, it, when he married Jan Sterling, he was quoted saying, and I love this, he said, if you go to bat often enough, you're bound to get a hit, which I love that. Yeah, well, we talked about third time's a charm, fourth yeah. time's a charm again. For him, it's fifth time. Fifth time's a charm. And and he and Jan Sterling had two children, a, a son named Adams and a daughter named Celia. We're going to post on the notes the must-see films of Paul Douglas, but I think you've said it already. If you can only see one Paul Douglas film... Yes. Which one would it be for you? And I said Clash by Night. Yep. But I, I'm going to give myself two. Okay, give yourself because two. Because you have you to see it. A Letter to Three Wives. <laughs> yes. I think that is, that's really a must see yes, just in general. It is, yeah. in general. Especially during this Academy Award season. Absolutely. So there you have it. Our new star of the month, Paul Douglas. Go see his movies. Check him out. If you're not familiar with him, go make yourself familiar with him. And we uh, can't wait to bring you April's Star of the Month. <laughs> I think it's time for the answer to our Hollywood pop quiz. Yes, and the question was, in the Paul Douglas movie 14 Hours, which screen goddess made her film debut? And I think you know this one, Nan. I do. Grace Kelly. It was. It was our future Princess Grace, who yes. made her film debut. And it's a really charming part, and she's lovely in it, and you could see the potential. Thanks for listening, everybody. We would love it if you would follow us on social media. Our handle is at From Beneath the Hollywood Sign. We're on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> and also, we'd love to hear from you. Any thoughts, ideas, comments, you could contact us at info at From Beneath the Hollywood Sign.com. That's this week's view. From Beneath the Hollywood Sign. You've been listening to From Beneath the Hollywood Sign with Steve Kubine and Nan McNamara, the podcast that celebrates amazing stories of Tinseltown from its golden era. Join us next week for another episode and learn something else about Hollywood you probably never knew. Take a moment and give us a five-star rating and a positive review. And tell your friends about us, too. It'll help grow the podcast. Visit Steve's website at FromBeneathTheHollywoodSign.com. The executive producers are Steve Kubine and Nan McNamara. Executive producer and post-production supervisor, Lindsay Schneider. This podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. Visit airwavemedia.com to listen and subscribe to their other fine shows like The Box of Oddities and The Shallow End with Schneebly and Toth. Copyright 2024. All rights reserved. That's a wrap. Thank you.